Hello YouTube. We're continuing our look at the species problem. Okay, so next up is the cohesion species concept, which was developed by Alan Templeton. Templeton says that a species is the most inclusive population of individuals having the potential for phenotypic cohesion through intrinsic cohesion mechanisms. Um, so essentially, this species concept begins with the obvious idea that the living world is separated into discrete clusters of organisms, and we call these discrete clusters species. So the question for any species concept is, what is it uh, that makes populations of organisms discrete? What is it that maintains this discreteness? Um, the morphological species concept uh, doesn't really provide a, a, any kind of mechanism for this. It just says that discreteness obtains in the fact that populations look different. Uh, the biological species concept says discreteness is created by reproductive isolation. Um, ecological species concept says discreteness is a matter of the particular niche that organisms occupy. Um, well, the cohesion species concept uh, focuses essentially just on all of these mechanisms that can maintain discreteness. It focuses on what it calls, um, what Templeton calls cohesion mechanisms. And this can include uh, uh, isolating mechanisms, but also many others. So uh, the cohesion mechanisms noted by Templeton include, first, genetic exchangeability. And this basically just means interbreeding between members of the group. And this uh, facilitates gene flow and helps maintain genetic homogeneity. Uh, reproductive isolation from other groups. So this distinguishes the gene pool of one species from another. So that's just like the biological species concept. Um, Templeton actually points out that his species concept focuses not just on reproductive isolation from other species, but also reproductive cohesion within the species. Though I'm not really sure that there's any significant difference between those two things. Surely uh, reproductive isolation from other species would suggest that the species is also reproductively cohesive within itself. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand Templeton's distinction there. Um, it seems to me that genetic exchangeability is basically just the same thing that the biological species concept is talking about. So second, we've got demographic exchangeability. And to quote Templeton, this obtains when all individuals in a population display the same ranges and abilities of tolerance to all relevant ecological variables. In other words, demographic exchangeability obtains between two organisms when they share the same niche. If two organisms share the same niche, they're interchangeable with each other with respect to their demographic attributes. Um, demographic exchangeability is an important cohesion mechanism because it determines the, the spread of new genetic variants and it ensures that the population is uh, subject to the same selective forces which sustain similarity. So suppose you have... Um, two populations that are largely isolated geographically. Maybe, for instance, sea levels have risen and the two populations are now mostly disconnected on two islands. So there's very little gene flow between them. So there's, there's, there's very little genetic exchangeability. But if the two populations are demographically exchangeable, if they share the same ecological range, uh, and if both islands have very similar environments, then each population will be subject to very similar selective pressures. And given that these uh, two populations are separate, genetic drift will tend to pull them apart, but strong stabilising selection could maintain their similarity. So you can see that demographic exchangeability works as a, a cohesion mechanism, keeping uh, populations the same. Now, the big question for the cohesion concept is whether uh, each of these criteria is individually necessary or merely individually sufficient. And this question leads to uh, something of a dilemma for the cohesion concept. Suppose we say that both genetic exchangeability and demographic exchangeability are necessary for a population to count as a species. So a true species must exhibit both genetic and demographic exchangeability. On this view, the cohesion concept is far too strict. Uh, it suffers many of the same problems we saw for the biological species concept. It doesn't apply to asexuals, for instance, because um, asexuals are not, uh, don't have any genetic exchangeability. Uh, Templeton himself rejects this approach. He, he takes the second option. So um, 
So, so, so we take the second option and hold that a population is a species if it has either genetic exchangeability or demographic exchangeability. This has the obvious benefit that it applies to all living things, but now I think the cohesion concept ends up being too liberal. It diagnoses as the same species populations that are obviously different species. Um, so when discussing the ecological species concept, we saw the example of the two ant species, where one species of ant outcompeted the other, and the ecological concept has difficulty with this. I think we'd have the same problem here, um, it, it, since, it, since if both uh, species occupy the same niche, they'd surely be demographically exchangeable, and hence would count as the same species. Similarly, we saw that the biological concept found us with the frequent hybridisation between different plant species. Again, same problem here. Frequent hybridisation means there's a lot of genetic exchange going on, hence they're the same species. So, um, I, I, I kind of like this concept, but uh, it sort of seems like Templeton is just trying to combine the biological species concept and the ecological species concept, um, and uh, it kind of doesn't really work. You, you end up with uh, the, the best of both worlds, but also with uh, the worst of both worlds as well. Okay, um, a very popular approach to the species concept has been uh, phylogenetic or cladistic approaches. Now, there are many, many versions of these, uh, some of which have significant differences, so it's kind of difficult to give a, an overview of them. But I think that most phylogenetic species concepts are united by a basic claim, which is essentially uh, all individuals of a species must... Uh, share, all, all, all populations that count as a species must share their most recent common ancestor. Phylogenetic concepts are inspired by phylogenetics, which is the study of uh, evolutionary history and uh, evolutionary relationships between organisms. Um, now, uh, to describe these relationships, we construct phylogenetic trees, which look like this. And I think this can help illustrate what um, this species concept is all about. So. Uh, this tree is uh, is pretty simple. Um, the tips of, of the tree and the nodes of the tree represent species, and the branches represent patterns of ancestry and descent. In this tree, you can see that the, uh, the cow and the whale are, are much more closely related than the cow and the camel, um, because the common ancestor of cows and whales is uh, much more recent. It's just here, whereas the common ancestor of cows and camels is over here. Um, now, some important concepts in phylogenetics are monophyly, paraphyly, and polyphyly. Uh, this diagram from Wikipedia shows these, these concepts. A group is monophyletic just in case it consists of an ancestral population plus all of its descendants. Uh, a group is paraphyletic if it consists of, of an ancestral population and only some of its descendants. So you can see that uh, this group is paraphyletic, this in blue is paraphyletic because it cuts out these descendants. A, a, a group is polyphyletic if it includes the descendants of two or more ancestors. Okay. Now, many taxonomists emphasize the importance of monophyly, and occasionally I've seen the suggestion that uh, phylogenetic species concepts involve the claim that species must be monophyletic groups. This can't work. To see why, consider the evolution of any animal, say humans. So this shows a, a phylogenetic tree for human evolution. The question is, how do we distinguish the ancestral population um, at this point here? Uh, surely this is a species. But if we call it a species, and if we insist that all species must be monophyletic, then this species also includes all its descendants. Humans and, uh, and chimpanzees and uh, gorillas and so on. So we'd be saying that humans and chimpanzees are the same species. Well, that's obviously absurd. Species, species can't be monophyletic. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the basic claim of most phylogenetic species concepts is that all populations of a species must share their most recent common ancestor. And this means that the population must not be polyphyletic. So on this tree, suppose you were to take um, this polyphyletic group as a species and class uh, lorises and tarsiers as a single species, excluding uh, all the others. The problem is that the most recent common ancestor of the lorises at this point, 
and the most recent common ancestor of the Tarsia is at this point. So populations of lorises and Tarsias don't share uh, their most recent common ancestor. Okay, um, summing up. Species must be at least paraphyletic. They must not be polyphyletic. I mean, maybe they're monophyletic, but we can't make this a requirement. What we require is that they are not polyphyletic. Furthermore, uh, most phylogenetic species concepts would hold that if we say that an organism is a species, then each organism in that group should be more closely related to every other organism in that group than they are to any organisms outside the group, at least at any particular time. So if you take a single snapshot of time, then if, if A is a species, all the organisms in A should be more closely related to each other than to any other organisms. Um, again, we're placing the emphasis on evolutionary history and evolutionary relationships. So how does this differ from other species concepts? Well, consider the biological species concept. Populations that are reproductively isolated may be more closely related to each other than to populations with which they can interbreed. Here's an example from Futuyama's textbook on evolution about the moth genus Greya. Uh, all of the Piperella populations can interbreed. However, the Piperella are reproductively isolated from the Mytilae. Uh, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. So for the biological species concept, there are two species here. There are the all the Piperella and then this single Mytilae. Uh, but, but notice that the Californian Piperella is more closely related to uh, the Mytilae than it is to any other Piperella. If we adopt the uh, phylogenetic species concept, we can't draw the line where the biological concept would. And we can actually imagine an even worse situation arising. Suppose that the, uh, the Idaho and Washington Piperella were to become reproductively isolated from the uh, Montana and California ones. Um, so only the Montana and California populations can interbreed. Maybe this wouldn't actually be possible given where Montana and California are. I don't know about the geography of America, maybe they're thousands of miles away from each other um, or whatever, but just imagine that the geography is different uh, or maybe the Montana population has moved closer to the California ones or, or something like that. The point is uh, these two can interbreed, but um, they become reproductively isolated from the Idaho and Washington ones. Um, clearly the biological species concept would say that these two are a single species excluding the others. This would clearly be unacceptable for the phylogenetic species concept. Uh, Montana plus California is a polyphyletic group. Okay, so a problem with standard phylogenetic species concepts is posed by hybridization. Um, I believe I noted in, uh, in the last video that different plant species frequently hybridize and often their hybrids are fertile. Uh, very often the hybrids can interbreed with each other but not with the parent species. This can occur with speciation by allopolyploidy for instance. So if we were to draw this evolutionary relationship we'd get something that looks like this. Um, two species A and B give rise to the hybrid D. D is isolated from both A and B. Uh, and over time these lineages may diverge significantly from each other. So clearly we'd want to recognise um, at least three species here, A, B and D. The obvious problem is that we can't say that the organisms in lineage D share a most recent ancestor. There is no single most recent ancestor, but two. So this, looks, this would look even worse if D were to result from a hybridisation between A and C, for instance. Um, Perhaps this isn't a serious problem. After all, we could simply allow that the most recent ancestor be given as a conjunction. So we could say that the most recent ancestors of D are A and B, and that's, that's sufficient. We would have to be a bit careful here, though, because if we allow that the most recent ancestor be specified with a conjunction, then it seems to me that any two populations could be a species. So take this phylogenetic tree. Um, we could say that the organisms of B and E are all a single species because the population B plus E shares the most recent ancestors at H plus J. So we'd have to be kind of careful how we uh, sort of work that out if we're going to specify most recent ancestors as a conjunction.
Um, one way to avoid all these problems is provided by Mark Ridley's cladistic species concept. What is cladistics? Well, cladistics is basically just phylogenetics. Uh, some people use the terms interchangeably, some use cladistics to refer to a particular set of methods for phylogenetics, uh, but both cladistics and phylogenetics are concerned with the evolutionary history, the evolutionary relationships between populations. So for our purposes, cladistic species concept is really just another way of saying phylogenetic species concept. But uh, Ridley has decided to call his particular phylogenetic species concept the cladistic species concept. But um, don't, don't worry too much about the name. So Ridley's species concept is probably the simplest of all the phylogenetic species concepts, and I think it avoids some of the main problems. According to Ridley, a species is a set of organisms between two speciation events or between a speciation event and an extinction event. In other words, a species is a set of organisms between branches on a phylogenetic tree. Here's um, an image from Ridley's article that illustrates the idea. At time t1 we start off with species A. A new species evolves from A, species C. Uh, so we, we have a branching on the tree, okay? We have, and and um, two new species, B and C. And this kind of species concept copes very well with hybridization. So here's uh, another uh, image from, from Ridley's article. D and K have hybridized into species H. So it's very simple. For every new branch on the tree, we have a new species. Um, actually, I should note that this image is maybe not very realistic, because usually when species hybridize, the two parent species don't simply go extinct. If D and K had persisted as well, then we would have three branches representing a trichotomous speciation event. Uh, the hybridization of D and K would have produced three new species, P, H and Q. Um, but uh, all you need to remember for this species concept is that if, if you draw the, the phylogenetic tree, every time you put a new branch on there, you get a new species. Um, so down here we have species A, that, that branches, so then we get B and C, uh, C branches, so we get E and D, and so on. So that's, I think, very, uh, very simple. That's, that's a nice, that's a nice uh, simple species idea, and it, and it copes perfectly well with, with hybridization. Okay, let's consider some problems. First of all, there's the problem of anagenetic speciation. There are essentially two types of speciation. There's cladogenesis and anagenesis. In cladogenesis, the parent species splits into two daughter species. In anagenesis, the parent species becomes a new species uh, as a result of changes in its own lineages, in its own lineage. There's no splitting. The parent species uh, sort of morphs into a single daughter species without, uh, without splitting off into anything else. The problem is that this form of speciation would seem to be ruled out by Ridley's definition. If we were to draw anagenetic speciation on a tree, it would simply be a straight line with no branching, which means it would all be one species. Second, this species concept generates new species even without change. On Ridley's definition, if species A produces a new species, B, then A ceases to exist, and we have B and C. Um, as uh, Ridley put it in his article, this is, this is rather like saying that a mother ceases to exist and becomes a new person just because she's given birth to a child. So, summing up these two problems, on Ridley's cladistic concept, uh, the, the concept of species becomes totally divorced from phenotypic differences. Radical changes don't necessarily result in new species, uh, and in fact, indeed new species can uh, arise without any change happening at all. Ridley's um, response to both of these objections is, is simply to bite the bullet. He says that both objections are inspired by thinking in morphological terms. Recall the morphological species concept, which we saw is deeply implausible, uh, defines species in terms of similarity between the organisms. Ridley's charge is that these two objections arise from our commitment to morphological thinking. In the first case, we assume that since the lineage has changed so much, it must be a different species. Uh, 
In the second, we assume that uh, the lack of change means that it must be the same species. Wrigley simply rejects these assumptions. And I think that's a fairly reasonable response, although I suppose we might worry about how far we could push it. I mean, it's conceptually possible, although extraordinarily unlikely, that a population could begin as um, a mouse or even a bacteria and then change gradually into humans with no speciation events occurring. On the cladistic model, this would all be one species. Um, I don't think that's such a big deal, though. I mean, nothing like that has ever happened or will ever happen. So um, I, I don't think we really need to worry about that kind of ridiculous sort of case. Um, maybe a, a more serious problem uh, pointed out by Mark Ereshevsky is that it's very difficult to apply phylogenetic concepts to prokaryotes. This is because of lateral gene transfer, which I explained in the last video. Bacteria and archaea promiscuously share genetic material. Um, this means that different parts of the genome of any one species are going to have widely different evolutionary histories. Some parts of the genome uh, will have been transmitted vertically through the usual processes like binary fission, but much of it will have been captured through uh, mechanisms like conjugation, transduction, transformation. So how can we determine the, the real history of the species as a whole, given that there's all this sharing of genetic material going on? Uh, Ereshevsky notes that one solution to this, uh, to identifying microbial species, is using what's known as core genes. The core genes control central functions like cell division and metabolism, whereas auxiliary genes are involved with things like uh, the kinds of environments the organism can inhabit and the kinds of resources it can use. Core genes tend not to be involved in lateral transfer, so are, are good indicators of the phylogeny. However, Arashevsky points out that first, core genes comprise only about 5% of the genome, and second, while it might not happen so often, it's certainly possible for organisms to capture foreign core genes, and in some cases this can be beneficial for them. Lateral gene, gene transfer happens less often with core genes, but it still happens. So appealing to core genes uh, maybe dampens the problem a little bit, but doesn't really solve it. More seriously, even aside from lateral gene transfer, uh, genes uh, can have different phylogenies. This need, uh, need not result from, from lateral transfer. Standard vertical transfer can cause this. Here are four images taken from uh, Coin and Orr's article on speciation. Um, so A, B and C are three different species and the, 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 the thick branches represent their phylogenies. The thin lines with dots are gene trees representing the phylogenies of the genes. Um, so so you might so uh, in in this case for instance we have a particular gene here that is in uh, species a and we can kind of track that back to its its ancestor um, the trouble is that different genes have different phylogenies in in this case um, we can see that a b and c are clearly distinguished as different species but obviously this uh, kind of the, the, the differences, the way that different genes have different phylogenies, that has the potential to cause problems in cases where we're unsure whether two populations are the same species. And we try to apply this method of analysing core genes. When we analyse core genes, they're going to have different histories, so that's going to make it very unclear whether we have how to distinguish the populations. I mean, imagine if, for instance, uh, instead of having three clear species, we were to analyse it sort of, we were in the middle. Uh, of this particular tree just here, say. Um, it would be very difficult in this case to use these genes to determine uh, which species are which. In any case, I mean, putting aside all of these problems, I think there's something kind of ad hoc about this suggestion of appealing to, to core genes. The only reason why we're ignoring auxiliary genes is that these cause problems for the phylogenetic species concept. But why shouldn't we simply conclude from this that there's something inadequate about the phylogenetic species concept rather than concluding that auxiliary genes should be ignored? I mean, bear in mind, it's not like auxiliary genes are trivial. They comprise most of the genome and have important functions in adapting the species to the environment. Finally, there's a fairly obvious problem with the phylogenetic approach, as I've explained it. The phylogenetic concept only supplies 
necessary but not sufficient conditions for identifying species. Two populations of organisms are a species uh, only if they share uh, their most recent common ancestor, only if they're more closely related to each other than to anything outside the population. Well, fine, but that's incomplete. Ridley's cladistic uh, definition makes the problem explicit. A species is a set of organisms between two speciation events or between a speciation event and an extinction event. Well, what exactly is a speciation event? Surely, in order to tell whether, uh, whether or not a speciation event has occurred, you need to have some prior understanding of what a species is. So the definition ends up looking uh, viciously circular. The solution is that phylogenetic species concepts often include other species concepts. So uh, in order to define a speciation event, the cladistic concept has to appeal to other concepts. But then this raises the question, if we have to appeal to some other concept anyway, why not simply define species in terms of that concept? Why do we need the phylogenetic species concept at all? Okay, um, we've examined five different ways of defining the term species, uh, morphological, biological, ecological, cohesion and phylogenetic. They all have some obvious limitations. Uh, now, in fact, I've only scratch the surface of species concept. Uh, at, at this point there are probably something like 20-25 going around in the literature. So we have a lot of options, um, but there hasn't been much progress on deciding which one to adopt. This leads naturally to the thought that maybe our way of approaching the problem is mistaken. So the unspoken assumption of this presentation so far is that there must be one right answer. What is the one single species definition? This view is attacked by species pluralism. On pluralism, many different species concepts are equally legitimate. There are many equally legitimate ways of dividing living things into species. We don't have to dogmatically insist on adopting just one way. So there are many considerations that motivate pluralism. First, um, as I've mentioned, the failure of monistic approaches. The species problem has been around for a long time. Um, there are a whole bunch of different solutions, and it doesn't look like we're going to agree on one anytime soon. So that suggests maybe, maybe the, that many of them could be legitimate. Second, we should expect that there are different types of species simply because there are different kinds of evolutionary forces. Evolution is, is messy and complex and multifaceted. We have uh, natural selection, gene flow, genetic drift, um, and evolutionary processes are inextricably tied to the particular environmental context. The biological species concept is obviously hinting at something important. R reproductive isolation is clearly important for evolution, but it can't apply to asexuals. So that suggests uh, we need other species concepts for them, obviously. Maybe an ecological species concept would be more plausible there. But the, the, the wide, there are many different kinds of evolutionary forces we might expect would lead to different kinds of species. Third, and more generally, there are many different kinds of things in the biological world. Um, we've been considering uh, mostly plants, animals, bacteria. The tree of life divides into bacteria, archaea and eukaryotes. Within eukaryotes there are the plants, animals, fungi and protists. Although protist basically just means eukaryote that isn't a plant, animal or fungi. Here's the eukaryotic tree of life. Uh, you can see there's a huge variety of, of eukaryotes. Here are the plants, animals and fungi. So the rest of them are protists. Um, you can see that we uh, don't have... Yeah, I mean, the, the usual plant, animal, fungi is only a very small fraction of the entire eukaryotic world. Bacteria and archaea... Uh, also exhibit an enormous variety of life. Consider extremophiles. There are thermophiles, uh, heat-loving organisms that can live in scorching temperatures of up to 120 degrees. There are halophiles that thrive in extremely salty waters. Acidophiles that live in extremely acidic conditions. And arguably, species don't end with life. What about viruses? Many biologists hold that viruses aren't even living things, since they don't have cells and they don't have their own metabolism. And yet, there seem to be different species of virus. Virologists and microbiologists will often talk of virus species. There are prions. Prions uh, cause 
pretty serious diseases. The most famous is uh, Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, uh, mad cow diseases as it was known in the UK, since it was transmitted from infected cattle. Uh, and uh, it causes degeneration of the brain. Um, Creutzfeldt Jakob disease was caused by prions. A prion is essentially a, a misfolded protein. So proteins have extremely complex three-dimensional shapes, and this is what allows them to perform such an enormous uh, variety of activities in the, in the living organism. Um, now, a prion is a protein that is folded in the wrong way, and it transmits this incorrect folding to other proteins. Uh, so a, a prion will alter normal proteins so that they become misfolded in the same way the prion is. And then these new prions will alter still more proteins. Prions are quite remarkable because they don't even have any DNA or RNA. And yet it seems that we can talk about species of prions. There are different kinds of prion. They do different things. They're subject to natural selection and mutation. Fourth, uh, reflecting the diversity of life, there are many diverse sciences of life. Ecology, evolutionary theory, systematics, molecular genetics, biochemistry, botany, zoology, paleontology, physiology. The concept of species will appear in all of these sciences, uh, and it's to be expected that different sciences may need to precisify this concept in different ways. Here's a quote from James Mallet about the uh, different uses of species concepts. He says, the main use of species in taxonomy and deriv derivative sciences is to order and retrieve information on individual specimens in collections or data banks. In evolution, we would like to delimit a particular kind of evolution, speciation, which produces a result qualitatively different from within population evolution, although it may of course involve the same processes. In ecology, the species is a group of individuals within which variation can be ignored for the purposes of studying local populations or communities so that species can compete. For example, uh, while subspecies or genera are not usually considered in this light. In biodiversity and conservation studies and in environmental legislation, species are important as units which we would like to be able to count both regionally and globally. Philip Kitcher makes the uh, interesting point that there are at least two di different parts to any question we might ask in biology. First, there are the historical or evolutionary relationships. Um, we, we might look at the history of a particular species, for instance. And then there are structural or functional considerations. So we might look at what role the species plays in its ecological community, how it behaves in relation to other species, and so on. At least two different concepts of species follow from this. For instance, historical evolutionary considerations might lead to the phylogenetic concept, structural functional considerations might lead to the ecological or biological concept. Now with all of these points in mind, uh, it, it would be fairly incredible if there were just one legitimate way of grouping entities into species. Of course there is um, the, the kind of big question here, which is, how exactly can we decide, do we decide which species concepts to use? Can we use just anything? I mean, there's a difference between holding that there are many acceptable species concepts and holding that determining species is totally arbitrary. Well, defenders of pluralism generally agree that there are a variety of uh, constraints on appropriate species concepts. Here are a few suggestions from uh, Jerry Coyne and H. Alan Orr, quoted in Futuyama's textbook on evolution. Futuyama said, uh, uh, lists them as giving five criteria. A good species concept should first enable us to classify organisms systematically. That's a fairly obvious point. We need some clear way of distinguishing species. Second, correspond to discrete groups of similar organisms. Third, help us understand how discrete clusters of organisms arise in nature. Fourth, represent the products of evolutionary history. And fifth, apply to the largest possible variety of organisms. Coin and all themselves favour the biological species concept, but then so they're not uh, pluralists. But defenders of pluralism could appeal to criteria like like those. Now, one way of defending pluralism has been suggested by um, Massimo Pigliucci, who argues that species is a family resemblance concept, uh, drawing on the work of Wittgenstein. One of Wittgenstein's main arguments was that philosophers don't pay enough attention to how people actually use language. In particular, he was very sceptical of conceptual analysis, of um, the way that philosophers will analyse words to get to their real meaning. Uh, for Wittgenstein, language is 
irreducibly complex, and it's messy and it's inextricably connected to practical activities, to what he calls forms of life. Speaking a language involves being part of a particular form of life, uh, involves engaging in shared projects and traditions, conventions and cultural practices and so on. So if you want to know what a word means, you have to consider um, it, it, the, the form of life in which it occurs. You have to consider its context of use. So we have this idea of a, um, <coughs> of a family resemblance concept. What's family resemblance? Well, Wittgenstein introduced this, uh, this idea with the example of games. What exactly is a game? Wittgenstein says that there's no one single definition of game. There is no single set of properties that all games share that makes them games. Any time we attempt to define the word game, we'll end up either excluding loads of things that are games, or including loads of things that aren't. Just think about all the things that games can be. There are board games, card games, video games, competitive games versus purely cooperative games, solo games versus group games, games involving special equipment. There are weird abstract games like Hypergame, which generates a nice little paradox. Look it up, Hypergame. Uh, or The Game, the one where if you think about it you lose. Um, many games are fun, but there are, uh, there are violent, coercive games, and so on. So games aren't sorted by strict definitions. How do we determine whether or not something is a game? If there's no strict definition of game, how do we, uh, how do we, how do we know whether or not something's a game? Well, it's, it's simple. Something is a game just in case it bears an appropriate resemblance to the various other things that we call games. Let's say that game 1 has properties A, B, C, D. Game 2 has properties B, D, G, H. Uh, game 3 has properties C, E, H, I. And then we come across some new activity that has the properties E, F, G, H. Now notice that this new activity doesn't share any properties at all with game 1, but we might still class it as a game just because it shares enough relevant properties with other games. This is how we, uh, we actually identify games in real life. So um, uh, I want you to do something for me now. Uh, pause this video and look up a video on YouTube call, called uh, Inuit Throat Singing, Kathy Keknek and Janet Aglukak. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing their names correctly, so sorry if I'm not. But uh, just go and watch a minute of that now. So pause this, watch a minute of that, and then or more if you want. This is about six minutes, and then come back. Okay, so what was going on there? Well, suppose it turned out that at the end of this, one of these women was declared the winner. And suppose there were a specified number of rounds. And suppose there were specific rules, such as if one woman makes an R sound, the other has to respond with an er sound. In that case, I think we call this a game. Not because it fits some definition of game, it just clearly has enough game-like properties to make it a game. Piglucci's suggestion is that we treat the concept of species in the same way. There is no one single definition of species. What makes two populations of gram-negative bacteria different species might be completely different to what makes two populations of corvids different species. However, this doesn't mean that it's impossible to tell when a population is a species. It's just that instead of consulting definitions, we consider resemblances to paradigm cases. So it kind of works a bit like this. Uh, there are paradigm examples of populations that count as the same species, and paradigm examples of populations that count as different species. Here are some paradigm examples of the same species and paradigm examples of different species. So what we do is we, we have this, and we, we this is just part of our background knowledge, this is just part of our the, the, the background way in which we would use the word species. Then when we come across two populations of organisms and we want to know whether or not they're species, we simply consider them in relation to these paradigm cases. Are they more similar to groups in the first list or more similar to groups in the second? Now just to clear up a potential source of confusion, you might be thinking, well, okay, isn't this just the morphological concept? Remember, the morphological species concept says that what makes a group of organisms a species is that they have sufficient similarities to one another. Isn't this what this idea of family resemblance says? If organisms resemble each other enough, they count as the same species. 
Well, no, that's not what this says. The idea isn't that we group organisms based on similarities between the organisms. Rather, the idea is that there are various different species determining properties, and they're all equally legitimate, and whether or not a property counts as a species determining property depends on its similarities to other species determining properties. In deciding whether or not a group of organisms count as the same species, there are various different properties we can appeal to. Now, this might include resemblance between the organisms, or it might not. Pigliucci gives a useful diagram that compares concepts of games with concepts of species. Uh, something is a game if it has enough of these properties. Uh, similarly, a group of organisms count as a species if they have enough of these properties. Um, so, problems with the family resemblance approach. First, I think the biggest worry with this approach is that it's going to end up being too liberal. It can end up counting almost anything as a species determining property. We saw earlier that we need to draw distinctions between different properties because some properties that we might use to define species are clearly misguided, uh, and, and some properties should be weighted more heavily than others, and so on. But the family resemblance uh, method doesn't really provide any guidance. So, I mean, take uh, the morphological species concept. Well, I think there's a good argument that this species concept is straightforwardly wrong and misleading. Uh, even if we use morphological criteria in practice to identify species, in principle, it's it's clearly wrong-headed. Um, because we have things like significant polymorphism within species, we have uh, incredible mimicry between different distantly related species, and so on. And similarly, the ecological concept clearly gives the wrong answers in some cases, such as with the species of ant that took over the same ecological niche as the other species. So... I, I find the pluralistic approach attractive, but there has to be some limits. Now, the trouble is that for, from the family resemblance method, it's not obvious that you can actually specify any limits. Um, so if we ask the question, uh, is this an appropriate property to distinguish species? Uh, or when should we use this property to, to distinguish pe species and when shouldn't we use it? Family resemblance is of no help. If a property is similar enough to other properties uh, that we use to define species, then it's acceptable. Um, in which case, how how can we rule out the morphological concept uh, and the ecological concept, uh, at least in certain cases? Um, I mean, again, this is particularly a problem because we might we might say that the ecological concept is applicable in some cases, but not in others. But in those other cases, how do we rule it out? Because in those other cases, it's we could say, well, the ecological concept we use it in this in this case. Why shouldn't we use it in this case? Um, one response to this, I suppose, is simply to note that which properties we should use to distinguish species depend on the particular field or even the particular needs of the study, uh, of the particular study. Uh, and these are going to be different on a case-by-case -case basis. The point of appealing to family resemblance is simply to clarify a conceptual issue. It's not the role of philosophers to tell scientists which concepts are appropriate to use in science and which aren't. So we, sh we shouldn't ask our solution to the species problem to provide any criteria uh, that determine which species concepts scientists can appeal to. I think the trouble with, th with this response is that it makes the family resemblance approach nothing more than a description of pluralistic use of language in science, which is frankly trivial. I mean, obviously scientists define species in different ways. That's why there's so much controversy about how to define species. Um, so this just that kind of response just renders this approach um, kind of empty, I think. Second, uh, I, I think there's a concern that the whole idea of applying family resemblance to a scientific concept like species is fundamentally misguided. We apply the family resemblance method in cases where it doesn't make any sense to be exacting. But the whole point of science is to be exacting. Um, I'm not an expert on, on Wittgenstein because... Well, the truth is, I, I don't actually like him very much. I, I know that's not a popular opinion among philosophers, but whenever I've tried to read Wittgenstein, I, I just want to throw the book out the window. Um, but my understanding is that Wittgenstein wasn't against precise definitions, period. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he would have said that in the context of empirical science, precise definitions are indispensable. Consider the word force in physics. Well, force has a special definition in physics. If you think about our use of force in everyday life, uh, there's a huge variety of different uses. Uh, 
some of which will overlap with the physical definition, some of which will be far removed from it. When you start dealing with empirical science, you need to nail definitions down more precisely. Wittgenstein wouldn't have objected to that, as far as I can tell. Now, biology is a science. So when we consider the species problem, we're not dealing with uh, everyday colloquial language. Species is a technical scientific word, which means that it can and should be defined precisely, which means that the family resemblance approach is not appropriate here. Um, I mean, with all of this uh, said, I, I actually quite like pluralism. Maybe the family resemblance approach has problems, but the basic idea of pluralism, uh, I, I think I'm inclined to say that that's probably the way to go with, um, with, with this particular problem. Um, OK, well, that was a species problem. Bear in mind that we've only scratched the surface of, of the enormous literature here. So if you found it interesting, uh, I recommend looking up, reading a bit about it yourself, because um, there's so, so much more than what we've talked about. But that's all uh, for now. Goodbye.